maana ni dai ndoto ah lazy ya rock ya rock ya rock ya rock bueno ken kama ni takafon ya takafon lo rain de youtube ya takafon lo rain de youtube takafon lo ya rock ken I will describe the feed-forward controller. Yeah. 
I will describe the feedforward controller that we designed uh, and show some results using only this feedforward controller. Uh, okay. Uh, so I will I will explain about the feedforward controller and show some results, and then I will show how we improve the robustness to slopes uh, with a once per cycle minimum feedback, and I will show some results uh, for that. And finally, I will show how we found the, the parameters for these controllers using uh, multi-objective optimization with genetic algorithms. Okay, so by pillar robots, we have two of the most famous robots, uh, the Honda Asimov here in white. It's one of the most famous uh, humanoid robots. And uh, on the right, we have Atlas, which is much newer. It's from Boston Dynamics. And it was uh, the robot selected to participate or to the main robot on the DARPA uh, Robotics Challenge, uh, which was trying to give a big push for these uh, autonomous robots and especially bipedal robots. Now we participated uh, together with the Robil team in this DARPA Virtual Robotics Challenge and I will show a quick video uh, of what we accomplished. So I'll just, just let the guy in the video do the talking. <coughs> In order to complete task 2 of the virtual robotics challenge, we originally intended to extend our successful CPG based dynamic walking controller as well as the immediate implementation of the call technology. However, due to the tight tamper of the competition and the ever changing simulation framework, we decided to take the dynamics interface controller, then roll out of the starting pan and approach the mount. The developers of the duplicate framework that included the same signal sequence, forward going to the mounting, and backward forward to the mounting. The mount is Furthermore, two different motion sequences were designed to turn in place in the low and normal ground friction conditions. Uh, he can uh, he can walk, 
And here he is using uh, crutches, but for example, uh, one of the applications that we could do with, with my research uh, would be to implement it so he can have uh, balance and be able to walk without using crutches. Uh, then it can also be used for prosthesis, for example, Biome, which were recently featured in a prestigious TED talk. Uh, they can be used, of course, for search and rescue, wherever humans can really go, uh, rehabilitation, companionship, and many more uses. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, passive dynamic walkers. Uh, these are basically uh, some mechanical con contraptions that uh, are able to generate a passive gait when walking down slope. So they have a sort of balance between the potential energy that they're gaining by going down the slope and the kinetic energy that is lost uh, due to impact whenever they take a step. Uh, so these uh, contraptions are not technically robots because there is absolutely no actuation, there are no uh, electronic components, no motors, no anything. Uh, and they generate a, a passive walk. And this passive walk is actually very similar to how we humans walk, and it's very energy efficient. So of course we would like to uh, imitate this. And there are several robots that do this facility mimicking. Now we don't just want to create a robot that will walk down slope, we want to create a robot that will also be able to walk on flat terrain. This is what most of these uh, robots do. And they do it uh, quite uh, efficiently. So, uh, this is the compass pipette model. This is the model that we used for, uh, our, uh, for our research. It's a simple two degree of freedom model. It's basically two rigid legs attached at the hip. And we assume that uh, one of the legs is always in contact with the ground. So this means that this, this uh, system is a piecewise smooth hybrid dynamical system. Uh, we have a, a smooth dynamics during the single stance, That's, that is when just one of the legs uh, is in contact with the ground. And when the other leg hits the ground, we assume that this is an instantaneous transition, so that the impact occurs instantaneously, which means that we have this, this, this continuous transition, and this is what makes it a, a hybrid system. Now this model is fully actuated, so I, like I said, we assume that one leg is always in contact with the ground, uh, we verify that, uh, that this is a correct assumption by making sure that the ground reaction force is always uh, positive. And actually, we can apply any any torque that we want. Since it's fully actuated, we can apply any hip torque that we want or any ankle torque that, that we want. But if we want to be able to take this out of the computer and into the real world, then for a certain uh, ankle torque that we want to apply, we would need a certain foot size. And this is actually given by the uh, ZMP constraints. ZMP is the zero moment point, and it describes the point where the sum of torques is zero. So basically, if, the, if this point is within the foot, then the foot will remain flat on the ground. And if the ZMP leaves the foot, then the foot will rotate um, on its toe or on its uh, hip. And uh, basically, this ZMP can be calculated quite easily. We need the, the torque angle that we want to apply. And we divide it by the component of this uh, ground reaction force that is normal to the plane. Okay, so let's talk about the research goals. What, <coughs> what we set out to do here is to develop a biologically inspired uh, control method that uh, adapts online to the terrain. What, the, what we mean is that we want this. Uh, we want to create an open controller <coughs> that without knowing much about the, the terrain, it can walk and it can adapt uh, to, the, to the terrain. And we do this with using only minimal feedback. Uh, and by this, we want to combine the strength of this feed forward approach uh, and also with uh, feedback control while minimizing their respective uh, disadvantages. Okay, so feed forward control. Uh, we use this biologically inspired uh, approach, which uses central pattern generators. Central pattern generators are networks of coupled oscillators uh, that coordinate rhythmic motions. And there are, there are several uh, researchers that have found that they are actually responsible for uh, rhythmic motions in animals. For example, uh, walking, swimming, chewing, <coughs> and well, you can see this kind of uh, uh, oscillators for example, in cats, 
we have <coughs> this uh, bunch of interconnected neurons that they manage to coordinate the activation of all the muscles, for example, in one of the legs. And you have four of these centers that can talk to each other, and they can generate different gates for the cat, for example, walking, trotting, bounding, etc. So these kind of networks, they are uh, very uh, useful and they are suitable for fast and energy efficient gates. And they can generate these uh, stable gates without using any kind of feedback. So they can be uh, completely feed forward, completely overlooked. But of course, they can uh, be enhanced with uh, some minimal feedback. So there are several, uh, several methods for modeling these uh, CPGs. Uh, one of the most common is with uh, angular output. Basically, we have uh, this oscillator, and the output from this oscillator is some kind of signal, some kind of uh, sinusoidal uh, signal. And this can be used as an angle output, which means that basically the CPU has joint trajectory for the, for the robot. And these joint trajectories are then enforced through uh, PD control. So in this case, it's not uh, feed forward. Using feedback in order, state feedback in order to close the loop. Uh, and then we can also have, for example, torque output, where this, uh, where this rhythmic signal that is coming out of the CPG is actually being used as straight as a torque of the joint. And what we did is we used this uh, CPG just to generate the timing out. So what we wanted to do was to decouple uh, the, this building of the torque signal and the timing of the signal. <coughs> In order to make it much easier. So it's more intuitive to design the controller instead of having to, to create this complex model that will output a certain, uh, certain signal, we can just uh, use a simple oscillator that goes at a certain frequency and it, it dictates the timing of the output and we build the signal separately. So our CPG approach, like I said, we use a very simple oscillator uh, with normal light phase, this is this can be seen pretty much as a clock that goes around a certain frequency and it goes from zero to one. When it when it reaches one, it is reset back to zero and it keeps going. Now the output for this uh, controller is is a combination of several pulses, and uh, each pulse is defined by a starting phase. That's basically <coughs> when on the clock it will start. Uh, some duration and some amplitude. Now here are some results uh, for the feed forward controller. Uh, we have a CPG controller with just one ankle pulse and two hip pulses, uh, which means that we have 10 parameters in total, one for the frequency of the CPG and then three for each of the pulses. And this controller actually generates uh, stable gates over a small range of slopes of minus 1.2 and 0 0.8 degrees. So this is quite a, a modest range of slopes. It's kind of small. But actually, if we consider that this controller is completely open loop and it knows nothing about the state of the robot and nothing about the slope that it's walking on, it's actually quite amazing that it walks on, on more than a single slope. And if we focus a bit on the, <coughs> on the signal that this is outputting, then we can see that uh, the controller uses a very strong hip pulse at the beginning of the gate. Here we can see we have the impact at the end of the gate, and then the CPG is reset. The phase uh, starts, and then we have a strong hip pulse that basically wants to throw the swing leg forward, basically swing it forward. And uh, then we have one weak ankle pulse that is active during most of the time, and this is also to propel the robot forward. Then the second hip pulse is just to slow down the swing leg a little bit before it hits the ground. So how can we improve this range of slopes? Like I said, we have minus 1.2 up to 0 0.8. That's about 2 degrees uh, that the robot can walk on. And we want to increase this. We want to make the walk on, on a much larger range of slopes. So what we do is we measure the terrain slope. And we can do this in several ways. Uh, and we just measure it. We can measure it throughout the gate. And then we feed it to the CPG just once per cycle. So the information on which slope it's walking on is fed to the controller once per step. And that way we don't need to, to rely on continuous feedback and we can have the time to calculate the, the slope uh, or do some uh, 
uh, some averaging, it would have a noise signal. And this uh, information is used first to modify the torque amplitude. As we walk on a steeper uphill slope, we need to invest more energy into potential energy. And so the controller needs to behave differently. So we modify the amplitudes of the torques in order to be able to uh, insert more energy into the system. And as we're walking down uh, steep slopes, we need to start to take this energy out. So this we do by modifying the torque amplitude. <coughs> and since we have the, the compass biped can be seen as also as an oscillator. So we have two oscillators and there is no real connection between them other than the torques that we are applying. So we also need to modify the CPD frequency in order to keep these two systems uh, interconnected. And uh, we use only linear gains, and linear gains were uh, sufficient to increase this uh, range of slopes by seven times. So we use the same underlying feed forward controller, the same parameters that we showed before, same signal. And we separate linear gains for going uphill and going downhill, uh, which means that we have eight additional parameters, two for the frequency and uh, six more for the uh, torques. Uh, this controller was actually able to work on minus eight degrees and up to plus seven degrees. So this is quite a big range of slopes. And well, all of you I think I are from the Technion and you have been walking around the campus. These are the, the kind of slopes that you find inside the campus, which are quite big, could uh, walk around anywhere at once. And here I'm showing uh, the phase plane. This is the limit cycle of the system. We have the stance part, uh, which starts here. And you can see that the, the leg is basically moving from a positive, uh, from positive angle to a negative angle, slowing down a bit, and then increasing the velocity again. Then it becomes a swing leg. And we have the here is the peak torque that is applied, and the, the velocity increases rapidly. Then it swings. Some of the velocity is lost due to the second pulse. Then keeps swinging until it, until it hits the ground, and the velocity is lost, and it becomes again the stance leg. And we can see the same uh, kind of uh, phase plane for minus eight degrees and plus seven degrees. Okay, and here we can see again the, some animation of the robot walking. And what I want to show here is how this minimal feedback actually the uh, activation of the controller. So this is when it's going uphill. It's very similar to what we saw before when it was walking on a flat terrain. Uh, the big change you see is now the ankle pulse is much stronger. So it needs to activate uh, the, this ankle torque much uh, stronger in order to be able to climb. <coughs> Uh, and this is actually on the limit of this uh, ZMP. <coughs> so if we try to apply a larger uh, angle pulse, then we will have to we will have to either put a larger uh, foot, or the foot will start to rotate on itself. And we can also see that the hip pulse became much stronger. And even the hip pulse that before was taking energy out of the system was uh, making the was slowing down the leg. It's now still <coughs> increasing the energy. Yes. In the uphill example, is the normal force always positive? Yes. Uh, I should have a slide here for that. <coughs> so here we can see the ground interaction, uh, which checks that in all of the uh, terrains, all of the slopes, we had a positive uh, force. And actually, we also checked what would be the, the coefficient of friction that we need in order for the robot not to sleep. All right. Uh, so that was when we were walking uphill. And as we were walking downhill, actually, after about minus one degrees, the ankle pulse that was used to propel the robot forward now needs to work against, uh, against the robot and take energy out. Uh, so now you can see that the ankle uh, torque changed sign. And now the hip pulse became much uh, lower. The first one is much, uh, much lower, and the second one is much stronger. So now we're trying to take more energy out of the swing. And then, like I said, the CPG, the feedback to the CPG, to the frequency was just to keep these two uh, synchronous. Now here we can see uh, the eigenvalues uh, 
the linear response parameter eigenvalues, which we compute with numerically and also analytically with the first order linear approximation. Uh, this was used, uh, this was uh, computed using the sortation matrix approach. Uh, my colleague Alex Brina will describe in her uh, talk. Uh, what, what we see here is basically the five eigenvalues of the system. We have uh, four for the compass white and one for the phase of the CPG. And we can see here that the first the one and two, they are uh, complex eigenvalues, so they are they give, for the amplitude, they give the same uh, value. Then we have two more, and finally a zero eigenvalue, which we expected uh, since there is a constraint for uh, both angles when they touch the ground. So these uh, eigenvalues were calculated for the contrast section, which we set right after the impact with the ground. And as you can see, uh, as the slope increases, uh, the linear approximation uh, becomes uh, a bit better. And this is because the interleg angle, that is the, the step length, is decreasing with the slope. Uh, but at the same time, the maximum angular velocity is increasing, and so the linearization or uh, error uh, is uh, increasing. Okay, uh, here we can see the controller just showing off. Uh, we just put it on a sinusoidal slope. This has an amplitude of 15 centimeters, so that means that this is walking uh, up slope and down slope uh, for 30 centimeters. And this repeats after 7.8 meters, which give us a maximum slope of plus and minus 6.8 uh, degrees. So this is basically uh, a periodical system on a periodical slope. Okay, so how did we find uh, such great parameters that can give us uh, such an amazing performance for the controller? So this controller had 18 parameters, like I mentioned. And if we want to, uh, to generate controllers with, which were even more complex, that means if we want to add more pulses, more impulses, more input pulses, then we need five additional parameters for each one of these pulses that we want to add. And if we want to do this by hand, then this is quite tedious and we, it would result on suboptimal performance. So what we do is we use genetic algorithms. And they are actually pretty good. So what are genetic algorithms? Genetic algorithms are stochastic directed search algorithms motivated by ideas from natural selection and evolution. So what does this mean? Basically it means that we can take all these control parameters and we can encode it uh, into a string of values, a string of genes, that's called the genome. And we have a big population of genomes, 2500. We evolve this population over 50 generations and in each generation, the, the genomes are, they keep improving. So what we do is, in order to improve them, we evaluate the performance of these genomes, and we have multiple fitness functions that we evaluate for each genome. And then we select the best genomes using the Pareto prompts, which I'll describe shortly. And the best genomes, they pass their genes on to the next generation, uh, so the next generation will be composed of the, the best traits of all the uh, genomes. So fitness evaluation, uh, we basically uh, used uh, numerical simulations, and the numerical simulations have the robots uh, walking using the parameters uh, encoded in the genome. And the simulation would run until either the robot falls, uh, the ZMP exceeds the fit dimensions, uh, the allotted time runs out, or the gate converges to a limit cycle. So this would be the, the best case, if that means that the controller was actually quite successful, and it was able to converge to a limit cycle even before the time ran out. <clears throat> so the fitness functions that we used, uh, we wanted to optimize certain controller traits, and we checked basically the velocity of the controller, how fast it was walking, we checked the energy efficiency, we checked the convergence rate to this limit cycle, and we checked the robustness to slopes. Now, when you when you use genetic algorithms, you have to make sure that your simulation is uh, perfect because if there is a little hole in simulation, then the algorithm will find it and it will take advantage of it. And also, as you pick your fitness functions, uh, you have to make sure that you pick the correct fitness functions so it doesn't converge to something like this. And 
yeah, this is not really a desired gate, but pay attention that the flailing of the arms for the girl on the left is actually making her go faster. So velocity fitness, like I said, it's basically the distance divided by the allotted of time. And uh, since we don't want all the genomes to run for uh, as long as we allow them, if they converge before, then we can stop the simulation and we just divide by the convergence time instead of the allotted of time. This gives the same fitness value. Energy fitness, we did this based on the cost of uh, transport, the specific mechanical cost of transport, which is uh, a non-dimensional uh, parameter, and it's we take the absolute control effort that the controller is applying, and we divide it by the weight of the robot times the step size uh, that it took. So this is basically how much energy you need in order to do a certain distance. And then we decide we define this function as a decreasing function of the cost of transport. As the cost of transport is going to zero. This will go to one, and as the cost of transport <coughs> increases, uh, this function will go to zero. Then we have the convergence rate fitness, uh, which is based on the linear convergence rate. Uh, this means the eigenvalues of the system. So if the gate converges, uh, we can calculate numerically the linearized comparison of eigenvalues, and we give the fitness by the uh, distance from the largest eigenvalue to the unit zero. So once again, this is to, to maximize the fitness value as the eigenvalue decreases. And then the slope fitness, which was the most important for us. Uh, we had separate simulations for going uphill and for going downhill. We started with the road walking on flat terrain, and then uh, when the road converged, the slope was constantly increased. So the road would walk from zero to one degrees, if it converged to a limit cycle on one degree, then we would increase it to two degrees, and then to three degrees, uh, until the robot failed based on some of the conditions that we described before. And then the fitness would be the times that it was able to uh, converge to the slope, and we add some trial time divided by the allotted time. This is how long the robot was able to walk on the final slope before it failed. Uh, and this is just so this won't be a, a piecewise linear uh, function. And finally, uh, since we wanted to have uh, robots that were able to both walk uphill and downhill, then we decided to uh, already combine both of these uh, fitness functions into one single fitness function. So the slope fitness is the uh, product of the uphill fitness and the downhill fitness. Now, uh, how do we select the top genomes from each generation? Then, like I said, we have four different fitness functions, and we could use each of these uh, fitness functions. We don't really know what's, uh, what value to give to each of them, what way to give to each of these uh, functions. So uh, we could have done some combination, uh, just pick some values and close our eyes and wait for one week and let the algorithm run and see what we find. Uh, but instead, we decided to use this uh, technique that's called uh, Pareto Prompts. What we do is we take basically this whole generation as uh, it can be seen as points in a four-dimensional space. And we can take this cloud of points and divide it into layers. So these layers are called Pareto fronts. And for example, uh, we can see here the green layer. Uh, this is the top, the outermost layer. This is we're taking here just for comparison to velocity fitness and the energy fitness. So all the, all the genomes that are on this layer, they are the best genomes. And as you can see, there are some that go very fast and are not so energy efficient. And there are some that are very energy efficient, <coughs> but they don't go as fast. So basically, in this layer has a variety of genomes. And the lower layers, why are they, why, are they, why did those genomes fall to the uh, lower layers? It was, for example, we have this green uh, X here. This belongs to the top layer. We have these two red ones here, which belong to a lower layer. If you see, this green one is also faster, as a, fast, as a larger velocity fitness, and it's also more efficient than these two. So this means that these two are Pareto dominated by the green one here. And basically, the uh, genomes on the lower layers are Pareto dominated by at least one genome 
on the higher layers, and this is how we uh, basically uh, separate them into layers. And then we can just pick the genomes from the outermost layers uh, and use them as the top genomes for the next generation. Uh, then once we have the, the top genomes set from the population, we can just combine them in order to create the next generation. So the top genomes pass already to the next generation. This is in order to conserve the good results we found. And then we have two operators that we use on these uh, <coughs> streams of values. We have the crossover, which basically you have one parent A and parent B, and you take two points uh, on this uh, genome, and then you mix and match these two genomes. So the idea is to try to find, uh, to combine these genomes in order to keep the best traits from parent A and the best traits from parent B. And uh, this basically just creates combination of successful values, but it doesn't explore new values. So for this we have mutation, and mutation it takes just a certain gene, and it changes the value of the gene by a small amount. Just one gene? Not just one gene, but each gene has a certain uh, probability of being mutated. But one way of mutation is to say that the chance of having a large mutation is much smaller than two or three small mutations. Well, actually, placed in, in the one cluster. Yeah, how, how we did it is we took for each of the genes it has a possibility of mutating, and then the size of the mutation also varies and it's distributed normally. So, yeah, so you have mutation on the large. Results of the organization. Uh, like I said, we had a population of 25 genomes, which we evolved for 50 generations. And, and we already, after two generations, we have some stable uh, controllers. That means that they are able to walk and converge to a limit cycle. And then both the, the velocity fitness and the energy fitness they keep improving at a relatively low rate. Uh, over the generations, and the one that took the most time to converge uh, was the slope fitness. And little by little, it keeps increasing until we obtain the, the results that I showed. And the best genome that I selected, uh, here we have the, the velocity fitness and the slope fitness that are normalized by the maximum value, which was about 0 0.8 meters per second for the velocity fitness and 56 for the slope fitness. So we took one that had the most slope, the highest slope fitness, that means the highest robustness to slope variations. <clears throat> it had an okay uh, convergence rate, it was pretty good on energy efficiency, and it worked on the, at 65% uh, of its top velocity. And now the interesting thing about using the, this Pareto front is that you don't obtain just one kind of uh, controller at the end of the iteration. So if you would use this weighted function, you would get just one controller that is the best. But if you use Pareto fronts, then you actually get a variety of controllers. And this variety of controllers can be divided, roughly be divided into four clusters with almost no overlap. And these clusters are basically divided based on the fitness functions. So we have some fast walkers on blue, and we have efficient walkers on red, uh, convergence walkers on cyan, and the timers on green. And you can see more or less a distribution of the fitness values for the other uh, for the other types. So you can see, for example, that the climbers were not the slowest ones and were not the faster ones, but were somewhere there in the middle. They were they were relatively efficient and they had an okay convergence rate. So let's see uh, what were the, the typical uh, torque signals for each of these uh, tribes. So we have the fast controllers, which had a very strong <coughs> pulse, followed by a quite strong uh, inco pulse. This was just to get the robots to walk fast. The efficient walkers, they used almost no actuation at all, just a very small uh, hip pulse. And then we have the quick convergence, which used a strong hip pulse, a small inco pulse, and then another strong hip pulse to uh, slow down the swing leg. And if we focus on the uh, on the oscillator, then you can see that the frequency converges to one uh, large peak, and this is at 1.4 hertz, which is uh, double uh, frequency of the swing. 
So this means that actually the controllers that we were evolving, they did converge to a controller that uh, exploits the natural dynamics of the system. And if we see the red ones, which were the most efficient ones, they are exactly all of them located on this frequency. So they chose just one frequency, which was the most efficient one. And if you wanted to walk a bit faster, you had the blue, which had a larger frequency. And if you wanted to be uh, to have a better convergence, then you would choose a uh, lower frequency. And another thing that is uh, worth mentioning is the, the gains for the slope for the frequency of the system, they are both negative. And that means that as we are walking, uh, after, as we're walking up slope, then the frequency is reduced, which means that for each step we're taking longer. As we're walking downhill, uh, we're taking less time for each step. And this is actually the same as what happens with humans. Uh, so this genetic algorithm uh, did find a similar control method that humans <coughs> use. So uh, once again, we can see here uh, each of the controllers and how they look. When we're walking, the fast walker is running pretty fast. It's ready to get out of this lecture. The efficient walker is trying to sneak out of this lecture very, very slowly. The quickly converging walker is, is kind of interesting because it converged to a period doubling uh, gate. All of the other gates were symmetrical, but this one looks kind of like a pirate. It takes one dark step and then limps with its bad foot. And finally, we have the, the good climber uh, showing off again. So, where do we walk from here? What can we do next with this research? Uh, we can, as I said, we have a family of controllers, so we can do interpolation between different controllers based on what we want to do. So, if we are running out of battery, we can choose an efficient controller, and if we are reaching some rough terrain, then we can choose the climber controller. In order to switch between these controllers, then we can either uh, switch between controllers that are uh, when the state is within the uh, regional attraction of the other controller, or we can do switching between two controllers using uh, an intermediate controller. And finally, we can implement this uh, same controller also with the genetic algorithm on more complex uh, models and also 3D simulations. We already have some of that. Uh, so this is uh, done in gross Zippo. It's the session environment as we used for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Here we have a simple uh, like video robot with flat feet. It's sort of like a 3D version of the Compass Pipette. This is still kind of like a, a planar robot because both legs are basically in the same plane. And we have a CPG-based controller which uses only one hip pulse. Uh, it has a toe pulse for the ankle and spring-like passive ankle. So this is like adding a, a spring, a torsion spring. I write the hip pulse amplitude based on the step length, and this was to uh, try and converge to a certain step length uh, in the case. So, in summary, uh, we generated uh, stable gates over a small range of slopes, so minus 1.2 and up to 0 0.8, with the fit forward controller. Uh, we saw that this controller exploits natural dynamics and generates very efficient gates. Uh, then we introduced uh, minimal feedback, and we saw that this improved the robustness to slope variations seven volt from uh, minus eight degrees up to plus seven degrees. And we used multi objective optimization with a genetic algorithm in order to evolve the controller parameters that gave us uh, such great results. So, to conclude, uh, the suggested fit forward controller exploits natural dynamics and to generate efficient and stable gates. This is what we set out to do. And also the minimal once per cycle feedback uh, increases the robustness to slope variations uh, seven times, and this is without overtaxing the requirements uh, of update uh, rate and natural fidelity. So this means that we don't need uh, some incredible sensors in order to measure the state of the robot or the, or the slope of the terrain, uh, which was pretty much what we wanted. Okay, questions? Yes. Uh, well, the, the, it's not technically a closed loop system because, like I said, we're using this uh, minimal feedback to update the parameters of the, of the open loop system. 
close to yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, I mean, you you could just update the parameters one once as you step on a new uh, on a new slope, and then the robot keeps walking in open loop. But the uh, the, the parameters that I showed before was basically for the closed loop. Here. Okay, so, so these were the eigenvalues for the closed loops. So this is going up to minus six degrees. Yeah, uh, we do it now on the numerical on the numerical simulations. It's the full model, and this approximation was uh, with the linear system. But you don't stability on the numerical simulation. You do it on the Poincare map that you construct on the linearized version. Uh, Where is the period doubling on this graph? Well, I uh, know it's it's not here. This is only for the for the uh, climber model. This is not for the for the stable for the convergence for high convergence rates, which have the period doubling. This is just a, for a single period. So I, I didn't show for each one of the of the families. I show only for the family. I think the question that uh, Dominic was trying to get for you, can you compute the stability yeah. of the full dynamical system, which is R5, you have two degrees of freedom and a CPU, yeah. so your, your numerical solution is hybrid in R5, and can you compute? Uh, well, for, for the numerical simulation, we do, we, uh, do a numerical integration, and then we do it for the full system, and we can also calculate it for period doubling. For the period doubling case, uh, and with the approximation, uh, which was done mostly by by Alex, uh, we can also calculate for period doubling, but this is again done for the linear system. Yes. Another question on this slide: uh, Why is it five? Uh, one one of five dimensions of five state variables in the whole correct section. Okay, so like I said, we have four for the compass pipette. We have. Uh, Two angles and two angular velocities, and then we have the CPG phase. So this is basically the CPG phase is kind of like a I think it's five parameters, but the whole career section is always increasing in one. Yeah, that's why we have a zero eigenvalue. So you can take a, a point career section which takes only four of these parameters, and then you get four eigenvalues. So the point career section is four dimensional. Yeah. Yes. If I'd like to generalize to a real situation where there's a natural displacement of two legs, mm -hmm. can I use your result for just having a mass that switches so that the center of mass stays above the center of the thing? Could that then use these results? Uh, yes, I assume that you could. I mean, what we, what we did was instead of moving some mass, it's just to change the torque, uh, torque we are applying. But Probably if you apply this same genetic algorithm to such a controller, then you could uh, you put the mass base on this, okay. Yes? So, I think that on your second slide, something troubled me and continued on. Okay. Um, you work a fully activated model. I'd be wondering why you did that and how would this look different if the undrafted model, which you cited the compass gate, which is undrafted, that's a passive one, but mm -hmm. later on, most of the work not using the and so on, and use the undrafted model. And I'm wondering how this relates to that. Okay, well, uh, let's, let's go back to just one slide. Uh, you can see that the thing that most the changes the most here is the angle attraction. And this is because the robot needs this, uh, this ankle actuation in order to be able to climb these uh, very large slopes. So like I said, uh, the controller, we can basically change the controller structure and decide how many para how many uh, forces we want to apply for the hip and for the ankle. So we can also apply this same uh, strategy uh, for an actuated model that uses only hip actuation. And with only hip actuation, it can find pretty good results that are able to go downhill. Uh, because it doesn't need to input so much energy, it just needs to find a way uh, of uh, spreading the legs to, to lose the energy. But it's not very good for going up slopes. So in that case, you do need the you do need the ankle force. 
And you were talking in the, in the, in the last one on the last slide about the zero, you were saying that you had the spring spring at the ankle. Uh, um, yeah. They were not so that was not fully accurate, but you actually had spring there before? So yeah, well in this case it's <coughs> it's not a it's not a compass by the model because we already have a foot. And here it's very easy to simulate whatever you want. Uh, it doesn't do it very well, but you can do any model that you want. So in here we have the, the under actuated version here. It's because uh, when we do the toe off, we are stepping on the toe of the robot, and then we don't have any actuation around the, the toe. So this, this is actually under actuated. Yeah. 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 If you introduce the D, don't you uh, stop the deep uh, actuation? The, you mean the, to apply some damping? Yes. Yes, actually, <coughs> in the beginning, we did apply uh, some damping to the system, but this was quite problematic for doing afterwards the, uh, the linearization, the linear solution of the system uh, for calculating the values. But if you do add damping, then you don't need the second pulse slow down the uh, so you can do this actually with just one pulse, one hit pulse, and one input pulse. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that there is an about range of uh, slopes. Yes. Uh, how do you determine this range? I mean, does it mean that uh, it, is it is possible possible to walk in uh, all this range, or does, does it matter what the, the initial condition, what the initial conditions are, or for any given initial condition, it's the slope it can walk? Okay, yeah, so we didn't calculate the regional contraction uh, for the system. I think this is what, what Eric will hopefully be able to do. Um, we did see, for example, if you check uh, the robot walking on a sinusoidal slope, then you can see that basically each time that it's walking on a different slope, should converge to a different mean cycle. So it's basically like for each step that it's taking, it's uh, inserting some uh, some disturbance to the step, and it's able to walk. Now, if I choose a slope, uh, a terrain that has a much larger frequency, uh, then it might be unable to walk on that terrain. So if I'm if I'm inserting this uh, disturbance at a fast rate, then it won't be able to. Do you have any intuition about why the period doubling is the quickest conversion? So that was the one that had the lowest eigenvalues? Uh, yes, this was the one that had the lowest eigenvalues. Do you have any idea why period doubling? I don't, I don't really have an intuition, but I did hear a talk uh, from one technical professor that, that mentioned that period doubling uh, obtained the lowest uh, eigenvalues of the period doubling. We had some, also some, some results in that. Yeah, yeah it, was, right. it was your talk. We never had the right. <laughs> Um, and the, the, the best intuition of why this happens is interesting that you got similar results. Yeah. Sorry, it's very good to go Okay, any more questions? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.